Well, hey, everybody, good to have you in service with us today. We are beginning a brand new three-part mini-series called Simple Christmas. I'll tell you more about that here in just one second. But first of all, we want to give some crazy love to all of our folks that are joining us online. You're coming to us from all over America and around the world. And a big shout out to all of our guys and gals and all of our correctional facilities. Come on, everybody. Would you just put your hands together? Would you make them feel welcome today? God bless you guys. Woohoo! And it's such an honor to be able to speak into your life. And I know that today is going to make a massive impact on every single one of us. Hey, while you're pulling up your message notes that are on your Life Fellowship app, let me just tell you that we are extending our Seeds year-end offering, our vision campaign. So we've had a lot of people this last week that are saying, hey, we're still mailing in our, and we're bringing in and sending digitally our offerings. Some others are, are still making pledges. And so we wanted to make sure that we incorporate all that before you give, we give you a total of where we're landing. So next weekend, on the 16th, 17th, I'm gonna give you guys the update. I will tell you that we have yet to hit both of those marks that we are believing God for. And so I'm just simply asking you to pray, listen to God, join with Tatum and I in this incredible opportunity to launch a second campus in Anna, Texas, and begin to move forward in the incredible things that God is leading us to. And I will say it like this, that we as a church, we will move forward at the level of the generosity of the people. So in other words, the speed in which we're able to accomplish the vision is not determined by me, it's determined by us. Okay, and so I'm just asking you to listen to God and let's just simply do what he says. And then, hey, everybody, we're just two weeks away from an incredible weekend. It's our Christmas Eve weekend. These have been, have become some of the most attractional services that we do all year long. So like, it's gonna be beautiful. We're gonna have like a baby grand piano in the lobby. We're gonna have stilt walkers and sleighs and s'mores and all kinds of beautiful music and a message that's gonna inspire people. And I'm just challenging you Take the opportunity that is Christmas, where people are more receptive to attend a service than at any other time of the year, and have somebody seated next to you. And, and I'll say it like this, the, your best yes comes not when you ask somebody, hey, why don't you come to Church of Life Fellowship? It's when you look at somebody and you say, hey, um, I'm gonna have a seat right next to me and I'd love for you to sit with me. We can stop by Blend's Cafe, pick up a drink and enjoy the miracle of the season and I'm gonna challenge every one of us to do that. But this series that we're in is actually gonna lead us all the way into Christmas Eve. And over these next three weeks, I wanna unpack, I want us to explore the three gifts that the wise men, that they brought to Jesus. Now, if if you don't know much about the Christmas story, let me kind of give you a little bit of context of things. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Not only that, he was born underneath the reign of a guy named King Herod. And there were these wise men, a lot of people call them magi, that traveled a great distance to come worship Jesus. Now, let me ask a question here today. I need, I need, I need 100% participation. How many of you, maybe in your home right now, or maybe in grandma's home when you were growing up, you have a nativity scene already set up or it's gonna be set up? Come on, where are you at? Put your hands up. Those of you online, okay. Now, how many wise men are always represented in the nativity scene? Right, there's always three. The question is, how many were there actually there? We, we actually, honestly, the truth is, we don't know. We don't know. Tradition tells us that there were three. In fact, tradition actually gives us their names. Melchor, Gaspar, Belshazzar. Like, honestly, there could have been dozens. We don't know. What we do know is that these guys were highly educated, brilliant thinkers. These were guys that were incredibly, extremely wealthy, and they traveled a very great distance to come and worship the one that they thought could potentially be the savior of the world. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew, it says that when they, talking about these 
wise men, when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. And notice this, everybody, they didn't come to a manger scene. It says that they came to a, a house. They entered in, and they, they didn't see a baby. They actually saw a child with his mother. In fact, most scholars and theologians believe that the wise men, these magi, showed up one to three years after Christ was born. And they bowed down, they worshiped him, they opened up their treasure chests, and they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, admittedly, when our kids were born, nobody gave us gold, <laughs> frankincense, or myrrh. Nobody did. In fact, we got a lot of diapers, onesies, passies, and the ever-important, all-powerful baby snot sucker. Come on, somebody. <laughs> we actually grew up in an era that it was that blue, old-fashioned kind. You stick that bad boy in the nose, you squeeze it, and you extract every bit of snot out of that little baby's nose. Well, apparently, I found this out the other day. There's a new modern version of this. So no longer do you stick something in their nose to suck it out. You actually put a hose in the baby's nose. And you suck it out like if you want to. You can actually suck the snot out of your own baby's nose. And I don't know why in God's name anybody would ever, like who even thought of this? And if you, if this is your first time ever hearing about something like this, you ought to thank God in heaven. Because if you want to from now on, you can actually buy something that will allow you the opportunity to suck the snot out of your own child's nose. I'm telling you, Mary and Joseph, they didn't get a snot sucker. But they got gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And these were incredibly expensive gifts, but very deeply spiritual gifts. In fact, all scholars and theologians, they all widely agree that not only were these gifts very practical that we're going to talk about here in the coming days of how the family used these gifts, but they were very symbolic. They represented the nature of who Jesus actually is. In fact, the gold represents the kingship of Jesus. Myrrh, it represents Jesus as the suffering servant or the Lamb of God. The meaning of frankincense is actually something that before I tell you what it means, let me just tell you a little bit about it. So according to all of my essential oil advisors, that there's a lot of them, <laughs> they tell me that frankincense is the Swiss army knife of the oils. Like it just has a lot, a lot, a lot of purposes. In fact, I know a little bit about these kind of oils, because there was a time that Tatum liked messing with all of these oils. In fact, I, I know this, that you put peppermint on your, tel on your tummy. I know that lavender is used for something else. And I, There was one oil that Tatum would put on. I mean, I'm telling you what, it stunk to high heaven. When she would put that on, I'd tell her, hey, that's the not tonight oil. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> She'd come on in. I'm thinking, okay, not tonight. Uh, so anyways, uh, what I did find out about frankincense is that it actually, it, it possesses antiseptic, astringent, diuretic, digestive, uterine, therapeutic, all these other things that are there that I have no idea even what they are, properties. Like it does a whole lot. To which you say, well, how did you figure that, that all out? Well, as a pastor, you guys know I only work on the weekends. And, <laughs> and so because of that, I just dink around on Google all day long. And I, <laughs> I happened to find that. So, 
No, but I'll tell you this. Frankincense was incredibly expensive, and it was used to heal sicknesses. It was used to heal up different wounds in people's bodies. But even more importantly than that, frankincense was used by the priests that they would ignite and it would create this smoke that would billow up, symbolic of our prayers being offered up to God in faith, asking God to move on our behalf in our lives. In fact, all scholars and theologians all believe that frankincense, and by the way, this is what we're going to study today, talks about Jesus as our high priest. Now, here's the reality. There's a lot of you that were not raised Catholic. I was not raised Catholic. So if you weren't raised Catholic, you're probably thinking about this going, okay, that doesn't make sense to me. I I don't understand how Jesus, like what's the high priest thing all about? So here's what I wanna do. I actually wanna do something a little bit different today. I actually wanna take you a little bit deeper. I wanna get a little bit heady with you in this message today, unpacking and helping to explore something. And if you guys think you can handle that, come on, tell me. All right, Chris, I can handle it. Come on, tell me. Okay, you asked for it. So in the Old Testament, the priests, they had one major job description, one major thing they needed to do, and that was represent the people before God. And that one job description is broken down into to two different functions. The first function is this. Priests made sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. So they would take an innocent animal. They would sacrifice that animal, representing the forgiveness of sin for the people of God. The second function of the priests is that they prayed prayers on behalf of the people to God. So when we see Jesus as our high priest, not only is he offering sacrifices, but he's additionally, he's offering prayers on behalf of every single one of us, every one of us. But I want to start here today by looking at the sacrificial part. So you would need to know that in the very beginning, In the book of Genesis, when Eve first sinned against God, that in that moment there was a divide between God and man. In fact, I'll say it like this. There were two opposing forces. It was the holiness of God and the sinfulness of mankind. And here's the thing that we got to understand. Admittedly, in the culture that we live in today, nobody likes to identify anything as sin anymore, right? It's not sin. No, no, you, you just have a problem. No, no, you're, you're just making mistakes. You're just, that, that's just your issue. But we don't ever call anything sin anymore. Don't you judge me. Don't you judge me. You can't, don't you tell me that that's sin. That may not be sin for me. Like, don't do that. One person said it like this. That sin is an outdated term to trick people into being good. Here's the challenge. That whenever we take God's holiness lightly, it leads to us taking human sin lightly. And until we begin to understand the holiness of God, we will never understand how much sin actually costs us. It's more than you can ever even realize. Everybody, God is holy. He's holy. In fact, that word holy in the Greek is the Greek word agnos, and it means this. It means to be separate. It means to be set apart. In other words, God is complete. He is perfect. He is without stain. He's without blemish. He is without tear. There's nothing that you can add to him to make him any better. There's nothing that you can take away from him to make him any better. He is perfect. He's in another plane. He's in another level. He is God. And his holiness is not just one of his attributes. It's who he is. So in other words, uh, I'll say it like this. His grace is holy. 
His, his, his mercy is holy. His words are holy. His thoughts are holy. His justice is holy. His mindset is holy. His love is holy. Everything that God does is holy because it's who he is. Here's the challenge. God's holy. You're not. Not you. Definitely not those of you sitting in this section right here, you know. <laughs> I know some of y'all, okay. <laughs> not, not you. Not the person that you know at the office, you think, oh, they're just the sweetest, kindest. Oh, they are amazing. They're just the most amazing person. No, not them. Not the guy speaking to you today. None of us. Like the Bible says this in Romans, it says, for we have all sinned. So like we have all horribly missed the mark. We have fallen short of the standard of God, of the glory of God. Listen to me, sin breaks intimacy with the very holy God. That's why God hates it so much. The reason why God hates sin is because it's everything that he is not. And not only does it break intimacy with God, it'll destroy your life. This is why in the Old Testament, the high priest once a year, he would take an innocent little animal and he would slit its throat, he would cut it, sacrificing this very innocent animal for the temporary forgiveness of people's sins. And he would do this on a day called the Day of Atonement, or it's a holiday called Yom Kippur in the Jewish culture. From there, he would go into the Holy of Holies, and the very first thing he would do is he would light the incense of the frankincense, and it would begin to create these massive billows of smoke that would begin to fill the entire place. The smoke going up to God would be symbolic of crying out to God, saying, oh God, please have mercy on on us, to which the high priest would take the blood from the sacrifice of that animal and it would sprinkle it on the mercy seat, symbolically representing that there needs to be the death of the innocent on behalf of those who are guilty. And then how many of you guys have ever heard of the statement, a scapegoat? You ever heard that? Have you heard people make that statement? You probably used it. A lot of you don't even realize that that statement actually comes from this practice right here. Because what the high priest would do is he would actually take then a small little goat and it, without blemish, perfect, and he would put his hands on this goat and he would symbolically and in representation transfer the sins of all the people onto this goat and send it, drive it out of the community into the wilderness representing that our sins have been driven from God as far as the east is from the west. Like, just it, it's gone. Now, let me just stop and just say this. Some of you are thinking right now, this is weird. <laughs> like, this is weird, Chris. So those of you that maybe, you, 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 this is like, <laughs> you're new to Christianity. You're going, man, that is, that's weird. Strange. So think about it like this. If I was the high priest, I would take this cute little cuddly little lamb and every single year I would slit its throat. I would collect all of the blood in a bucket and I would go into a certain room and I would light up some incense and I would sprinkle this on a, on a certain seat and I would bow down and I would begin to pray. To which there would be a lot of you who would be very mad at me right now. There's a bunch of y'all that would say, well, we're leaving this church. Like you think, man, that's weird. That's weird, strange. It's actually a little gross. Like it's, it's not fair that this innocent little animal has to die so that we can be forgiven. Who in the world came up with this? Well, understand today that God... God is just, and his justice demands that sin be punished. But not only is God just, God is also merciful. 
So God has set this up in such a way that not only does the sacrifice satisfy the justice of God, but it also extends mercy to others. In other words, the cost of forgiveness is paid for by somebody else. And there's something powerful about this. See, I want to show you that that's kind of an old animal thing that was a part of the old covenant. But thank God we're not a part of the old covenant anymore. We're a part of a new covenant. And I want to show you this better, greater sacrifice that God has provided for us. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, for God's will was for us to be made holy. So notice this, you're not holy by yourself. But it's always been God's intent that you would be holy. Well, how does this happen? Watch this. By the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. Once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which may never take away sin. Like it's only a temporary covering of sin. But our high priest whose name is Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sin, good for all time. Come on, somebody. I wish somebody in the house would just give God some praise and some glory that our sin has not just been covered. It has been expunged as far as the east is from the west. Not a temporal thing, but it is from everlasting to everlasting. In fact, let me give you a visual of this because I know that for some of you listening today, this might be a hard thing to actually comprehend. And so I actually want to show you a picture of when I was graduating from Bible college 26 years ago. And I actually brought it with me today. I want you guys to see this. And what I want you to really focus in on isn't the fact that I'm getting my diploma. I want you to focus in on the graduation gown that I was wearing. Because you would need to know that that's not the same graduation gown that I showed up to the ceremony in. So the graduation was being held at a massive convention center in downtown. And I remember I had gotten to the, to the arena very early because I believe that margin creates peace. So I, you know, I got there early, and so there really wasn't many people there. I was kind of in the back waiting for some of the other students to begin to arrive. And so I had been standing for a long time. So after a period of time, I actually sat down. And when I sat down, believe it or not, I sat down on a tuna sandwich. I don't know how a tuna sandwich got there. I don't even understand. I don't even know if one of the workers at the convention center, they put their tuna sandwich. There. All I know is that I sat down on a tuna sandwich. And when I felt the cold mayonnaise coming up through my gown, I don't even know how to describe it to you. My reflexes were faster than a cat. And that's fast. Man, I jumped up out of that seat. I bolted up so fast, and when I did, I ripped my graduation gown. So I want you to just imagine me. There I am with a ripped gown, with a big old mayonnaise stain on my butt that stunk to high heaven. It was kind of like my not tonight gown, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> My friends were laughing at me. I felt so incredibly awkward because here I am in this very real, very ripped, very stinky, very stained, very real not tonight gown, knowing that I'm about to have to get out in front of 10,000 people and receive my diploma. God is my witness. One of my professors comes up to me and he said, hey, I can, I can see you're not, things aren't going so well for you today, are they? I said, no, sir, they're really not. He said, why don't you take off that very stinky, very stained, very ripped graduation gown and put this new one on? And I'll never forget taking off that, that old thing and putting on something fresh 
and new and clean and perfect. And I remember I stood up and I walked on out there and I received my diploma. Can I remind all of us today that we have a very real high priest. His name is Jesus. And he sacrificed his life for you and I in an incredible way. And he gives us his robe of righteousness. And I want to remind you that it's not your robe, it's his robe. And he doesn't give it to you temporarily. He says, man, I extend this to you for all eternity. To the point that whenever God looks at you, whenever God sees you, he does not see your sinfulness. He sees the very righteousness of God on the inside because of what Jesus has done for all of us. Everybody, Jesus isn't a distant Savior who feels sorry for us, but he's a compassionate high priest who deeply cares for us. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews, it says, therefore, since we have such a great high priest, his name is Jesus, who has ascended into heaven, therefore since, who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. Like, don't give up your faith, everybody. Stand firm. Don't let the world knock this thing out of you. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. In other words, Jesus is not up in heaven looking at you saying, Really? Really, you're, you're dealing with that again. Man, I'm so disappointed in you. I'm so frustrated with you. No. We have one that has been tempted. And that word tempted there doesn't just mean tempted. One translation says this that he was touched with the feeling of our infirmity. In other words, every place that you hurt, every, every, every place where you feel wounded, when you walk through temptations, when you walk through tragedies, and you feel overwhelmed, he actually looks at you and says, I get it. I get it. I experienced it firsthand in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. And I hope today that you'll embrace this truth that Jesus understands. He understands. Every area that you feel tempted, he says, man, I identify with it. In the middle of your trials, he says, I get it. In the places where you hurt so deeply on the inside, he says, man, I've experienced that firsthand. I mean, if you ever feel overwhelmed and full of anxiety, I just want you to begin to think about Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Because here he was and his friends, they all abandoned him. He knew what was about to happen. In fact, the Bible says that he fell to his face in agony as unto death. In fact, let me tell you something here. This, this could relate to this moment in Jesus' life, and it may not. But you know that in the book of Revelation, it says that when John the Revelator saw Jesus, it says that his hair was white as snow. It was white as wool. Do you know that during the reign of Hitler in the Nazi concentration camps, that there are recorded, documented cases of some of the Jewish people that were underneath such immense stress that they actually went to bed one night with their hair dark and they woke up the next morning with it white because of the strain of the stress. Let me tell you something today. He gets it. He looks at you and says, man, I know what it's like to feel stressed and overwhelmed. You say, yeah, but I have, I, I have a crazy family. Let me tell you something. Jesus understands crazy families because he had himself a crazy family. And it's a spiritual principle. Every family has got some crazy in it. 
In fact, by a show of hands, how many of you would admit in your family, there's some crazy, come on, put your hand up. You got some crazy in your family. Keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Look around at those whose hands are not lifted up. Okay? Just wink at them. <laughs> Just give them a little wink, baby. <laughs> Because every family has got some crazy in it. Like Jesus said, I'm the Messiah. And they looked at him and they said, you're a lunatic. No, no, no. You need to understand. When, when, when you think about how much Jesus understands, you'll realize how deeply he actually cares. Because Jesus was the one that was conceived to a teenage mom out of wedlock. You talk about scandal. Growing up, Jesus was in a very small little town. People whispered all the time. He probably heard it all the time. Oh, that's just the little bastard boy. He grew up in poverty. He was made fun of over and over again, bullied. Satan came and he tempted him again again and again and again. And even in his weakest, most vulnerable moment of his life, Jesus did not sin. He st stood strong. Like he understands what it's like to lose the life of one of your closest dear friends. He knows what it's like to, to lose family members. Like he was the one that had people that they accused him of things that he never did. And the worst moment of his life when he was hanging on the cross he felt like there was a moment that God the Father abandoned him, even though he didn't. But Jesus was becoming our scapegoat. He is our high priest. He was taking on the sins of all of us, past, present, and future, from all of humanity on him in one moment in time. And God is too holy to look upon sin. So God turned away, and it was in that moment that Jesus looked up in agony, and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So in other words, if, if you've ever had moments in your life you just feel like, God, your presence seems so far away from me. God, where are you? <laughs> I need you, and it just doesn't seem like you're here. Even Jesus, the Son of God, can look at you and say, I get it. I understand. Like he, he's felt what you felt. When you hurt, he's hurt. He's your God that sympathizes with, with your life. Like he's not the God in heaven that looks down and goes, man, look at you, sucks to be you. No, he actually looks at you and says, I know what it's like to live in a human moral body and experience the pain of that. I know what it's like to go through temptations and opportunities to, to sin. I, I, I know. And I just think it's amazing that in God's divine providence, he sends these wise men, these magi, carrying three gifts, that represents who Jesus came to be for you and I. The gold, he is our king. Myrrh, he is our suffering servant, the lamb of God. Frankincense, he is our high priest who would be sacrificed for the forgiveness of our sins. And today he sits at the right hand of God the Father and he's talking to him about you. And so the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, it says, therefore, let's come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and I'll tell you what's going to happen. It's there you're going to receive mercy. Like he cares for you because he gets it. 
and you're gonna find grace from our high priest who is able to help us when we need it most. Listen, you need to understand that you can come to God just like you are. And when you show up before him, he's not gonna look at you and say, man, you disgust me, you infuriate me, you disappoint me, you embarrass me. No, 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 he's gonna bring you close to him. He's gonna wrap his arms around you and he's gonna say, listen, I've been in your shoes. I've walked where you've walked. I've experienced the pain. I've experienced the trials. I've gone through the temptation and I'm with you. I'm with you. Listen, you don't have to speak in King James when you speak to Jesus because he gets you. And so what I want to do in this service here today is I actually want to give you a gift. See, the reality is, is that for so many of us in this season that we're in right now is that we've been living such fast-paced, ramped up lives that it's maybe for some of us it's been a while since you've just quieted yourself in the presence of God and let him speak to you. And I've actually prayed that it's in this moment here today that every single one of you would have a moment that you would say, I didn't know it, but I know it now. He is my high priest and he's with me. So if you would do me a favor, I want you to close your eyes and just open up your hands. I want you to quiet your heart because I've asked the team to play over you instrumentally, instrumentally for the next few moments. And so Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for our great high priest, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that he is acquainted with with our life, our struggles, our wins, our successes, and also the heartbreaks of life. You know, maybe you're here and you have a loved one that is away from God, and maybe just during this moment of this gift that I give you, just you're gonna begin to pray for them, or maybe, Maybe you've been facing physical challenges in your body and the doctors have given you reports and it's just become overwhelming or maybe there's financial challenges that are happening in your life, your business, your family. And you're just like, God, I don't know how I'm gonna do this this Christmas. Maybe you feel overwhelmed. Listen, do you know that this is the season that more people commit suicide in this season than in any other month of the entire year combined? And I don't believe it's because you actually have more problems than at other seasons. It's just that there's something about this moment that you just feel more in tune with them. And some of you just need your great high priest to wrap his arms around you and to heal that broken heart. So come on, why don't you take the next few moments, quiet yourself before God in homes and crutches, correctional facilities and right here and let the Spirit of God come close to you.